What's going on everybody? This is James from About Trout and today we're covering fly reels. So from click paw to saltwater systems to anonization to full cage, half cage, all of your questions will hopefully be answered. So consider this a fly reel 101. Um, I've worked in fly shops for 20 years. I'm a full-time guide so over all that time I feel like I've gotten to know reels pretty well from saltwater to tiny little blue lines. Um, and hopefully this video will demystify fly reels for you, help you choose one that's gonna suit your needs, and just kind of clear up some of the foggy, mushy terms associated with reels. In different capacities, fly reels can serve a very important purpose and function, whether you're trout fishing or saltwater fishing, um, but they also look really cool, and I have definitely made choices to buy reels on that fact alone. Uh, so no matter what your budget is or what you're using them for, um, we're gonna cover that in this video. So first, what does a fly reel actually do? Well, number one, it stores your line. All right, keeping it basic, obviously the number one purpose of a fly reel is to store your fly line. And that is very important when you're choosing the size of the reel. We'll get touch on that later, but your fly reel needs to hold backing. Um, and your full fly line. Um, in some places, you know, it's not gonna really matter because you're never gonna see your backing. Like if you're fishing creeks on a two weight, a seven inch fish isn't taking you into your backing. Um, but on saltwater reels, that can become more important. Um, the second thing a reel does is it makes it easier to retrieve the fly line. That fly reel is going to allow you to control uh, the rate of retrieval depending on arbor size and some other things. We'll touch on that a little bit later. So we're just covering the basics here. Another important thing that a fly reel does is it balances out your fly rod. If you've ever been unfortunate enough to have a fly reel that's too light or too heavy and you're making that muscle, especially if you're casting all day, it can really induce fatigue. Um, if you're Euro nymphing, balance is really important, especially if you do have your arm extended, you want a well-balanced setup to not put that tension um, on the shoulder. If you're saltwater fishing, you're throwing a heavy 10 weight all day, you're tarpon fishing a 12 weight, streamer fishing, that can, that can really become a bigger deal um, the more you do it. When talking about fly reels, they're made for different things in different environments, whether there's gonna be corrosion resistant, which is really important in salt water, uh, the drag system, and matching the fly reel uh, to number one, the species you're gonna be fishing for, but also the environment. You wouldn't wanna take you know, a plastic composite reel like this on a saltwater trip and destroy it, or show up with a drag system and that's too light and be undergunned. So now that you have an understanding of what fly reels actually do, holding line, help you reel in fish, uh, some of them have drag systems, some of them don't, and they balance out your setup, um, let's talk about the specific parts of a fly reel and what those things can do for you. On this video, we're just gonna focus on direct drive reels. The vast majority of fly reels you're gonna see on the market are what are direct drive, which means you know, in order for that drag to engage, you have to let go of the handle in order for the drag to catch. And it, when you reel forward, it reels it backwards. So you spin the handle forward, and then you gotta let go in order for that drag to engage, the handle is gonna go backwards. That's a direct drive reel. Um, on an anti-reverse reel, the drag will engage without uh, the handle spinning. You'll see this a lot in salt water, um, especially if you don't want to risk getting your knuckles or your fingers blown up if you're fishing for things like big tarpon, sailfish, tuna, hard running fish. Um, they're very popular with surgeons and people that make a living with their hands. The most famous uh, anti-reverse reel, or the most well-known one, would be the Tibor Billy Pate series. Um, and, you know, if, if uh, you make a living with your hands and you're chasing big fish and you just want to mitigate all risks, that might be something to look into. The other type of reel, and it's pretty outdated now, is what's called an automatic reel. Um, those ones didn't even have a handle on them. There was a lever you could use to retrieve the line. Those kind of became outdated in about the 1970s, early 80s. However, the semi-automatic reel is currently pretty in vogue in the Euronymphing scene. I don't know anything about semi-automatic reels. Devin Olson really seems to like them, so I will link his video about them in the description below. But the, by far, the vast, vast majority of fly reels you are going to see are going to be direct drive fly reels. All right, when we're talking about fly reels and the anatomy of them, let's just first talk about what they can 
be made of. So one of the most common, especially on kind of budget setups, would be a composite reel, uh, like this Echo Bass reel. Uh, it's plastic, injection molded, and these are pretty common. They still kind of have they still can have decent drag systems on them. But if you're looking at those reels, kind of sub one hundred dollars, it's most likely going to be a plastic composite. Um, the downsides to plastic. Uh, one, you know, they can crack, they can shatter, they're not as durable, uh, but these get you in the game and they get you fishing and in a lot of your freshwater scenarios, um, this is really going to be uh, something that will take care of you for a little bit if you take care of this reel. Um, and then fly reels for the most part are made of aluminum, um, but how the reel is created differs. So there is... Um, cast aluminum like this Reddington Zero where they pour the they melt the aluminum down put it into a mold um, and that's how they get this shape and then there's what is called machined aluminum where there's two billets of aluminum one for the spool and one for the frame and we'll touch on that what those parts are but they physically drill um, all the porting out of the reel and the reel shape. Um, with cast aluminum, uh, because of the molding, they can get some pretty sharp angles um, and get some different shapes that you couldn't really get in the machining process. The downside to a cast aluminum reel is they can be brittle, they can shatter as well. Definitely going to be way more durable um, than a composite plastic reel. And just kind of broad brush strokes, generally um, when companies are selling these, the, they just they save their better drag systems for their more expensive reels, um, and I'm not sure exactly the exact. I'm not sure exactly what type of aluminum they're using for cast products. So with machined reels, they have the, the billets of aluminum. They drill out all of the porting on a lathe. Most of the machined reels on the market, whether it's Nautilus, Abel, Galvin, are all sourced from 6061T6 aluminum. And that particular aluminum, um, it, it's easier for them to anodize it. And anodization is there's just I'm using like an electro bath. It forms a film over the aluminum, which will make it uh, way more resistant to corrosion. So you, it's it's a necessity um, if you are fishing in a saltwater environment. I'm not 100% sure if they can anodize uh, cast reels because I'm not sure of the exact compound, but whether it's Nautilus, Hatch, Abel, um, I couldn't find out what compound t -War used in their reels, but that 6061T6 seems to be industry standard for higher for uh, the higher price point reels. So those are some of the pros and the cons of what you're getting in terms of the process in which the reel is built. The other advantage with machined reels is the strength. They are by, by far the strongest and the most durable reels. I have run one over with my car and I've still been good to go. Um, don't try it, but absolutely the most durable product um, in terms of the way reels are manufactured. So fly reels come in two parts. There's the frame and the spool. So we're going to start with the frame, which is the back side of the reel. So I'm going to open this up and that's so this is the frame of the reel. This is usually not always uh, where the drag system is. Um, on top of that, that's where you're going to see your reel foot, which is this little T. Um, if you see, these reels are from all different age ranges. Um, I have older reels on this table, older than I am. Um, but the reel foot attaches to the frame. It's the back part. Um, and when we're talking about frames, there's different components and different styles of frames. So this frame just has a simple line guard right here on the front. This frame is a very popular style of frame uh, that you're going to see in today's day and age with just the line guard and then the line guard on the back where the foot of the reel attaches. The other type of frame that you'll see in fly fishing is something called a full cage. So on this one you can see there's that outer rim. Full cage reels are really popular um, in the two-handed world where you're using really thin running lines and also in Euro nymphing when you're using thin leaders. What a full cage reel will allow you to do is keep those thinner diameter lines from jumping through the line guard and getting wrapped up in the moving components of the fly reel. Uh, the other style that Hardy has been pushing out, I don't know if this is kind of proprietary um, to Hardy, but they've, they're have they the only ones I've seen doing this. You can leave in the comments if anyone else is, but there's the half cage where 
like you saw on that Galvin, that outer rim went around. Hardy just has it right in the front. And that half cage, um, it's just reducing weight is why they did that. Got to be honest, I'm not a big fan of these hooks. They can catch a line on the back. It's a style thing. Um, but again, even that little half cage right here um, is going to prevent line from jumping um, into the moving parts of the reel. The frame of the reel determines the size of the reel. We've talked about the frame of the reel, and this is the spool. The spool is the part of the reel that's moving. This is what you're physically turning inside of the frame to retrieve your fly line. Um, and there's different components to the spool, and there's even different styles. But this just makes it easier to switch lines if you wanted to do that. Um, this is where your handle is affixed. This is where your counterweight is affixed and we'll kind of talk about what those things do here in a second. Um, also in your spool, that's usually what's gonna determine the arbor size. Uh, the larger the arbor, the better it is for the rate of line retrieval. In my lifetime, I have seen real manufacturers go from standard arbors to mid and large arbors now dominating the market. This is kind of a mid arbor reel, if you will. But this is kind of your classic setup. The other style, are cassettes and there's different companies that make cassettes so this is an aluminum reel right here from hardy um, but what's interesting with this one is that you can replace the cassettes so these are plastic cassettes what this is going to do is if you're changing lines a lot like if you're a streamer angler or you're a lake angler um, instead of buying spools for about half a retail price um, this is going to save you a lot of coin uh, because i think you can buy these things for like 20 bucks for a spool and it clicks in and you get all those advantages with these cassette style reels so here's your spool it's just going to click right back in lock it in and you're off to the races, you can change fly lines. Now that you have the plastic cassette on the spool, you can just rejoin it. Um, and like I said, I used to, I got into lake fishing pretty heavily uh, for a while there, and the ability to change, you know, different sink rates, things like that, um, it really makes having a spool system very nice. Probably the most common place you're gonna see cassette style reels are lake fishermen, um, especially in competitions or just out and about. Um, if you get into lake fishing, you're gonna learn real quick. You're gonna be spending a lot of money on different types of fly line. Next, we're gonna cover drag systems. So drag systems are just there to offer varying levels of resistance when you're stripping line off the reel, but especially when you're fighting and playing big fish um, and having the ability uh, to slow those things down. The two most common types of drag systems that you're gonna see on the market today are what are called click and pull drags and then disc drags. And then there's different levels of disc drags. Um, the other one that's very common is from Lampson, which is this reel, and they have a conical drag. Uh, inside of here and we'll touch on what a Lamson conical drag and what an able cork drag is um, at the end of breaking down drag systems so up first you got the tried and true old faithful the click and pawl it's a traditional and simpler drag system that relies on a clicker and a pawl to introduce resistance uh, that clicker is what's going to give you that classic sound and now on most modern reels that clicker doesn't really serve a purpose other than to hear the classic sound that we all love. When lines pulled out, the pawl engages with the gear, creating a clicking sound. The tension of the pawl against the gear provides resistance, controlling the rate at which the line is pulled. They're pretty simple, they're straightforward, there's very few components, and again, you kind of have that nostalgic sound. What's great with these is because the whole drag system is gutted out, they're, they're generally lighter, which is important if you're fishing, you know, zero weights, two weights, you're creaking, and they're really, really popular um, in, in small creek environments like I just stated. The other place where you'll see click and pause um, is in salmon and steelhead fishing. Uh, when that fish, when that fish grabs a swung fly, you don't necessarily want it to encounter a lot of resistance, uh, but the click and pawl mechanisms on those salmon and steelhead reels, things like uh, like, a, like a larger Hardy Perfect or a Hardy Bougle, uh, very popular in the salmon and steelhead worlds, they're, they're gonna have a way beefier click and pawl drag than something that you would use to go fight, you know, a 12 inch creek monster uh, brook trout. So they do upscale it for those purposes as well. And then, you know, on the table, with the exception of the lamps in and one of my ables over here, the rest of the reels that you see 
Oh, let's move the clickers out of the way. The rest of the reels that you see on the table, including this plastic composite reel, are all disc drags. The disc drag system is more modern and complex, and it just employs a series of different discs that provide smooth and adjustable resistance. Um, those multiple discs are usually made up of stuff like cork, carbon fiber, synthetics like Delrin, uh, which is like I think like a plastic. And as the fish pulls and you tighten down on the drag, inside it's going to compress those get those discs against each other to increase resistance, surface area of resistance uh, with multiple discs and, and really put the brakes on those big fish. An advantage to that is you can have these really buttery smooth drag systems which can come into play when you're fishing with really light tippet and fighting big fish like where I guide on the San Juan um, or if you're chasing things like tarpon, billfish, tuna and you need to really slam the brakes, uh, giant trevally on those fish and stop them. Some of the heat, larger saltwater reels, some of them I think go up to like 25 pounds um, of drag force. Uh, so pretty, pretty impressive stuff. When talking about drag systems in the disc drag world, a term that kind of gets thrown around a lot is what's called startup inertia. Startup inertia in a fly reel refers to the initial resistance or force required to overcome the static state and the set reel in motion when a fish takes the fly and the angler begins to retrieve the line. So basically it's just, you know, how much, how much pull is it going to take to get that drag to run smoothly when the fish starts to run and you have it set up, I'll back the drag off on this one, but you know, there's going to be some initial resistance. And then when the fish really starts running, uh, the drag will mellow out. Um, startup inertia, is it a big deal? I never thought it was until I became a guide on the San Juan. And so you hook a, a 25 inch trout um, on a 20 size 26 fly and 6x tippet and the fish starts to run. Um, if that reel has a lot of startup inertia, the initial, when the, when the reel starts to spin, initially there'll be a little bit more resistance and then it'll smooth out. But I've had some reels with higher startup inertia and that it's almost like it bucks where it t -t and bang, we snap the six X. Um, so if you want to avoid that, you can also start with that drag way backed off. And as the fish is running, start to, to dial it in. Um, but unless you're in a scenario like that, or you're trying to do like an IGFA line class record for something absurd, like, like four pounds, um, on a really large fish, startup inertia isn't that big of a deal, but I have come to quickly learn, um, that where I guide, it is a big deal. We'll just touch on the other drags that you'll see. Lampson is an incredibly popular brand. They do make a fantastic product and it's one of the most common reels you'll see on the market. Um, usually with a Lampson, going back to what we first touched on, they pretty much all have the same drag system except for some of their higher end models. It's this conical drag that I'm holding. And basically the way it works is it's like there's a cone you know, it like <laughs> there's a cone and as you push it, it, as you tighten that drag, that cone spins inside that socket and slows the fish down. So what you're paying for with the Lampsons um, on a lot of their models is, is it cast, is it machined? And the more machining, the more expensive, if it's anodized, things like that. But Lampson does have a unique drag system with that conical drag. So just wanted to touch on that. This Able reel is my baby. It was given to me as a wedding gift for my lovely wife. Um, but <clears throat> this is a cork drag. There's a big cork disc. It's not sealed or covered, so grit can kind of get in there. The Ables can, the older style uh, Ables can be a little more maintenance. I know a lot, Able has moved to, I, I do believe they're still producing cork drags. Um, they're super reliable. They require a lot more work because grit can get in there, uh, but they're very smooth. And if you really look at it, it is basically just kind of like a, a naked disc drag uh, where elements can get in there. But some people still use cork, uh, but this is kind of a Abel's proprietary way that they do it. Um, if you are going to have a reel with a cork drag, you really want to make sure to lubricate it with Neat's foot oil. They require more maintenance, um, but I, uh, I've really enjoyed this reel and I've landed a lot of great steelhead on this thing. Okay, so then with your drag systems, we've really kind of covered the different ones. So the other term you're going to hear is sealed drag and then the other and fully sealed to make it totally confusing. But like this animus that's opened up, right, that, that drag system is, is sealed because it's covered. Um, that Lampson that I showed you um, is a sealed drag. When I open this up, there's an O-ring in there, 
so the drag is sealed from the elements inside of this tube. The other term you're going to hear is what's called fully sealed. Uh, an example of that is going to be this Nautilus. So O-rings do fail, things can get into the drag system. A fully sealed reel is gonna be something like a hatch or a Nautilus where you're gonna need special tools to get inside of this drag housing. So that gets thrown around a lot. In a saltwater reel, I bought this Nautilus when I was living in Costa Rica. There are no fly shops. That might've changed um, since I moved away from the country, but I just didn't wanna risk anything getting in my reel, screwing it up. Um, O-rings do break, they do fail, and there's just different levels of protection. Most of the drags, the disc drags that you're gonna see today are gonna be sealed with the exception of like some of the orbital, um, some of the able cork drags that are wide open like that. But let it be known that d debris and particles can still get into the drag housing and, and screw your reel up. So something to take note. This echo base reel, while the disc part of the drag is technically sealed, um, that bearing is open and exposed to the elements um, that hold that in. And you're just gonna see that on the higher end reels, you're going to get higher end drag systems. But just kind of showing you different manufacturers, the way that they seal their drag, you know, again, okay, like on this Galvin, you're not getting, on this Galvin, it's sealed. I'm not sure if it's totally sealed. Again, to my knowledge, um, I think Mako, Charlton, Nautilus, and Hatch uh, might be the only ones where you really need special tools. Like you're not you're not getting into that into that drag housing. But just something to be aware of uh, what you're paying for, especially on you know reels that cost eight, nine hundred, one thousand um, dollars. And and you might question, well, this has a sealed drag, and so does this reel. Um, so making sure and understanding, you know, fully sealed. Um, is an important term. Let's continue our way exploring what makes up a fly reel. So with your fly reels, we talked about the drag system. For most most reels, that drag adjustment is gonna be on the backside of the drag system itself when we're talking about disc drags, even the cork drag of the able. This thing right here, this is your drag knob, which is going to adjust the amount of resistance when you're pulling line off the reel or when a fish, hopefully a big one, is doing that for you. I don't think I have any reels. Don't have a drag knob on the back with the exception of click my click paw reels. Um, even on the back of a click paw reel, there is a little handle here which will put some tension on the spring, um, on the paw uh, that's in there to give you uh, like a smidge more of resistance. Going back to the front side of the reel, to the spool, you have your, um, have your handle. This one used to have a nice rosewood handle until I dropped it on the ground and cracked it. I got to get that replaced. Most real handles today, back in the day, I think they made them up like ivory and stuff. Most of what you're going to see today is going to be some sort of plastic composite um, or aluminum. I mean, those are the most popular. I do have an able reel on my boat right now that has a zebra wood handle because treat yourself. But that serves absolutely no function at all. It just looks cool. And then if you need to, for whatever reason, change the handle, like 99% of the time, you know, the handle nut is just located right on the back side. Then the other thing to talk about on the front of the spool is this little weight here. This is your counterbalance. So if that reel is spinning uh, quickly, it doesn't put wobble on the spool. Now, not all of my reels have counterbalances on them. The counterbalance can also, you know, keep that reel from rattling around, causing vibration during your casting. My click and pull reels do not have counterbalances on the front uh, because of the setup with that click and pull system. Um, they're not going to be, you know, shaken around like on a disc drag reel. Um, and then also, you know, you're, these are creek reels. Like if you're hooking a fish that's burning offline that fast, I mean, you can palm your, you can palm the outer rim if you'd like, but. Um, you're really not going to see those on these lighter reels. Most of the disc drag reels on the market, and then even with uh, Lamson's conical drag system here, they put fake clickers in there so you can hear the sound. Um, so this one broke off the Animus, but it was right there to give you that sweet sound. On the Lamson, you have a little plastic clicker right there. Uh, to give you that sound. On this Nautilus, there's no actual clicker on the outside. 
Um, and when you retrieve line, it's silent. Some people really like that. Um, and if you don't like the sound of a clicker, you can usually just remove it from your reel. Um, and then you can hear it on, on the outgoing. You can get that click, which I believe on this reel um, is internal. Last thing, and it's back to the spool, is the way that uh, your spool release. So on my Nautiluses, on my Hardies, um, on this Ross Big Game 4, which they don't make, um, it's a nut. So you can just unscrew it like that to remove the uh, reel from the spool. Uh, with my Ross Big Game, or I'm sorry, with my Ross Cimarron 5, they don't make this one either, but there's just a little lever in the front. You can push that, compresses a spring, um, and it releases the spool from the frame. Some reels like Galvin, they have a push button. You just push that in and it's just a variation of that metal pawl. You'll also see that on the Hardy, um, and then in terms of the button, you know, you, you, you get that on this Reddington Zero right here. You can just push, pop that thing off. Um, the only ones that are different would be the Lampson, and then um, this Ross Animus. So with these, there, are, there is no spool, there, there is not a spool release. You just pull the reel apart. There's an O-ring, which creates tension in there, and that's, just with a pull. So if you know if you buy a Lampson and you don't see a spool release on the front, or you buy a Ross Animus and you don't see a spool release on the front, I believe most of Ross's reels um, have gone to that uh, with that O-ring. So just, just pull it apart, you're good to go. And then when you're ready, you can just pop it in there. You'll hear a positive click, you're back in business. Same thing with the Ross, pop it in there, you're good to go. There's the, there's the spindle right there of the reel. Pull it apart. You're ready to go. So I think that should cover us from yeah, for uh, for fly rails. We learned about the materials they're made of, uh, the cages, uh, line guards, handles, spool release, counterbalance, drag adjustment system. Spool, again, go into the spool release, the spindle, and the drag system. We know the anatomy of a reel. We understand what they're made out of. We learned about the anodization process and how that can keep some reels from corroding in salt water. And um, I hope this will make you a more informed buyer uh, on your next reel purchase. But yeah, uh, reels are a thing of art and they're also a thing of function. I mean, to be honest, that plastic composite reel, like this one right here with an okay drag system is gonna cover you in the vast majority of your freshwater fishing situations. If you are spending time in the salt water and you don't make that initial investment, that reel is gonna get corroded, destroyed. You hook a big fish, you're gonna want that drag system. So I spend more money on my salt water reels. And if you're fishing somewhere where you're hooking big fish on light tippet and small flies with a hook can torque, little things like startup inertia, that can be a big deal. But I'm, I've definitely been guilty of buying reels for, for looks, for sure. But that should about cover it. If you think I forgot anything or there's a question I didn't answer, just drop it in the comments below. We'll be sure to touch on that. But I like reels. Hopefully we learned something. Definitely learned about uh, aluminum compounds researching this video. Hope everybody enjoyed it and I'll see you guys on the next video.